In L.A. this week, the FBI and LAPD arrest millionaire Robert Durst for the 2000 murder of an L.A. resident. This just hours before HBO airs its final episode of a documentary in which Durst may have admitted his guilt. Or was he just rambling? You be the judge. LAX is one step closer to making it easier for passengers to get around. I'm Yana Kay. The details next. Springtime is here and the Aussie Zoo Babies are out. I'm Anna Marcos. We'll have more from the LA Zoo on these cute little baby kangaroo joeys. Welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. It seems like almost everyone is talking or tweeting about the arrest of New York real estate heir Robert Durst for the 2000 unsolved murder of his good friend, LA resident Susan Berman. Durst was the topic of the popular HBO docuseries, The Jinx, that was just about to finish its six episode run when news of his arrest broke. The HBO series finale of The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, concluded with what appears to be a confession by Durst to the murders of three individuals when he forgets to remove the mic after an interview and goes into a restroom where he mumbles various things, including the words, Kill them all, of course. Well, one of the three murders Durst is suspected of is that of Susan Berman, seen in a photo with Durst, whose body was discovered in her West Los Angeles home on Christmas Eve 2000. They were longtime friends. Just hours before the finale of The Jinx aired on HBO, the FBI in New Orleans, in conjunction with the Los Angeles Police Department, arrested Durst on March 14th for Berman's murder. The long-term investigation was conducted by the Los Angeles Police Department, L.A. District Attorney's Office, the FBI in L.A. and New York, the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, and New York State Police. LAPD Chief Charlie Beck has said that their case is independent of the documentary and will stand on its own. The director of the documentary, Andrew Jarecki, has told several media outlets they did hand over evidence to officials several months before the finale aired. Durst is also suspected in the 1982 disappearance of his first wife, Kathy Durst. He was tried but then found not guilty in the 2001 murder and dismemberment of his neighbor in Texas after arguing self-defense. And that takes us to this week in tweets. Viewers, law enforcement, and celebrities alike have taken to social media to discuss this riveting case, the HBO series, and Durst's arrest. The LA District Attorney's Office tweeted, New York real estate heir charged with cold case murder. CNN's Anderson Cooper tweeted, if you haven't watched the jinx on HBO, watch it now, all of it. It's awesome. The final scene, crazy. And celebrity Haley Baldwin tweeted, it's all fun and games until you miss spell Beverly Hills. And if you don't know what that means, you'll have to watch The Jinx or read the countless number of articles now on the internet. Police Chief Charlie Beck says a shooting attack on two of his officers in South LA on March 15th and the shooting death of an unarmed black man, Azel Ford, by police last year are most likely unrelated, despite both occurring near the same intersection. Beck says the attack on the cops was the result of an ongoing feud between two gangs. The shooting of the two plainclothes police officers on Sunday, March 15th at the intersection of 65th Street and Broadway took place while they were sitting in their vehicle. The officers are from LAPD's 77th Street station. Azel Ford, a 25-year-old black man, was shot and killed by LAPD officers near the same area back in August 11th, after police say he tried to pull an officer's gun from its holster. But LAPD Chief Charlie Beck says, quote, whether or not Mr. Ford's unfortunate death had anything to do with it, I seriously doubt. This has been a conflict that is ongoing, referring to the gang-related shooting of the officers. Police say three people were questioned in connection with the shooting that left the two officers with minor injuries, but were later released from custody, pending further investigation. The officers returned fire, but it was not known if any suspects were hit. As for the internal investigation into the police shooting of Azel Ford, findings will be presented to the police commission next month. 
LA City Controller Ron Galperin has launched a site to help make the LA Department of Water and Power more accountable in light of recent revelations about its botched billing system. Gilreus reports on the new DWP utility panel that you can access online. It's an easy to access site which for the first time makes the LA Department of Water and Power's financial data available in one place. LA City controller Ron Galperin talks uh, about a new is. online portal that reveals LA DWP payments for just about everything, from employee uniforms to payroll to overtime. The site, called the DWP Utility Panel, also includes performance data on water main breaks, also call wait times for customers. While the utility panel does not answer every question that is raised about this extraordinary, complex institution, it shed light on its operations, its finances, and makes them transparent. Launch of the portal coincides with a scathing state audit of the DWP's new billing system. That system has failed to collect over $680 million in customer bills, according to the audit. In response, LA City Attorney Mike Fewer has filed a lawsuit against the vendor hired to implement the system, PricewaterhouseCoopers. With transparency at the LADWP's goal, City Controller Ron Galperin says he's also resuming his own audit of two utility nonprofits. Over the years, the DWP nonprofits have collected over $40 million in ratepayer money, with little or no explanation as to how that money was spent. In downtown LA, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The DWP Utility Panel is now online. Access the site at utilitypanel.la. Methane gas, a potent greenhouse gas, is a growing environmental concern, but city leaders are working with scientists to figure out how to reduce it. Yana Kay reports. You may not see it, but it's all around us. Methane gas, a primary component of natural gas, is being released every day into the atmosphere, polluting the climate and contributing to global warming. That's why city leaders, scientists, and environmental groups gathered recently for the city's first-ever methane symposium to come up with a plan to reduce methane emissions. The science is pretty clear. We know where the emissions are coming from, and we know that we can cut up to 40% of those emissions really at a zero cost because the methane, when you keep it in the pipes and you can sell it, it's a thing that people pay for. It's a commodity that we don't need to be releasing into the atmosphere. Methane emissions come from various sources such as oil and gas production, gas leaks and landfills. Officials say agriculture and animal waste release the most methane gas into the atmosphere. But efforts are already underway at Southern California Gas to control methane emissions. Our system um, is so um, pervasive in Southern California, it can be used to help capture some of the methane from the dairies and the farms and the waste. Um, so that we can use that methane and turn it back into CO2. CO2 is carbon dioxide that plants convert into oxygen. And if officials can succeed in capturing methane emissions from agriculture or oil production, it can lead to a renewable form of methane. According to Nassau Research, Los Angeles produces one of the worst methane footprints in the nation. In fact, methane emissions are 60 percent higher than previous estimates. But city officials say they are dedicated to get methane emissions under control. I want the city of Los Angeles to come out swinging and show the international community our commitment to strong climate action. Now officials say there are some things you can do right now to help reduce methane emissions. And one of those things is to reduce the amount of meat that you eat and increase your levels of produce and fish. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. Methane gas traps 84 times more heat than carbon dioxide in the first 20 years after it is emitted. An LAPD detective is recognized for his work in fighting hate crimes. Rasha Goel takes us to the Anti-Defamation League's annual award ceremony honoring law enforcement. LAPD detective Ross Nemroff was among those being recognized for fighting hate crimes. He, along with other law enforcement officers, recently received the Sherwood Prize for their commitment to reducing hate crimes and bigotry in the community. I was the investigator on a transgender hate crime involving a transgender in uh, the city of Los Angeles. Uh, she uh, was a victim of hate. This case uh, went through the court process from preliminary hearing to trial, and then the, the uh, suspect was eventually convicted. Sable Simone, who Detective Nemroff helped, was on hand to share her story. I remember I got a phone call from him, and he said, well, do you need me to come 
you know, how big you are. Do you need anything? And I had never had a cop say those things to me. You know, I had never had a police officer to be there in that way for me. The award ceremony was presented by the Anti-Defamation League. It's not just important for the criminal to be arrested. It's important for the community to hear that they are supported when there's a hate crime. Awards were presented to group honorees for preventing international terrorism and to individual honorees for their independent work. These cases are extremely difficult, but also extremely divisive and threatening to our communities. So the fact that the ADL takes the time and puts the energy and effort into celebrating successful case prosecutions, it sets a great tone. And helps strengthen the rapport between law enforcement and the community it serves. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The Sherwood Prize was created in 1996 by Joe and Helene Sherwood, founders of Daniel's Jewelers. Los Angeles police officers in the West Los Angeles Division now have an added layer of protection, literally, when coming face to face with gunfire. Yana Kay explains. These new tactical vests are the latest piece of safety equipment that will be used by LAPD officers in the West Los Angeles Division when they're in the field. This is our way to give back to the heroes that protect us every day. Community members and city leaders, including council members Paul Koretz and Mike Bonin, gather to deliver a total of 16 vests to the LAPD's West Los Angeles Division. The vests were donated by the Friends of West Los Angeles, a nonprofit organization that supports West LA schools, libraries, parks, police, and fire. These vests go over their existing uh, bulletproof vests and they provide extra protection. They also provide a place for the officers to store uh, equipment uh, as they go on raids. The vests will be used by LAPD detectives and narcotics officers who oftentimes find themselves in situations with dangerous suspects such as gang members. It behooves our folks to be very cautious and prepared and these flak vests will help them to be prepared. And officials hope that one more layer of protection will help keep more officers out of harm's way. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. Some relief for the homeless is headed to the valley where more and more of the displaced have congregated. As Gil Reyes reports, new affordable housing is being built with some rooms reserved for military veterans. Coming to the community of Valley Glen, east of Van Nuys, is housing for the homeless. These include tenants with special needs, those with disabilities or suffering from mental illness. It provides them with opportunities to get health care and mental health and uh, substance abuse prevention and so many other things that will help them to, um, to become long-term housed individuals. Area Councilman Paul Krikorian talking about the soon-to-be-built Crest Apartments in the 13,000 block of Sherman Way. Not a homeless shelter. Shelters are transitional. Supporters call this permanent supportive housing aimed at keeping residents off the streets for good. Over 60 units will be available, over a third of them reserved for U.S. veterans. Studio-sized apartments, about 350 square feet or so with a bathroom and a kitchenette. Also a health clinic and social service workers on site. The Skid Row Housing Trust ventures outside its home turf in downtown to build the complex west of North Hollywood. The cost, $20 million. The city of L.A. is helping to pay for less than a third of it. Call it an investment in the city's goal to end veteran homelessness by the end of the year. In Valley Glen, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. The five-story Crest apartment complex in Valley Glen is expected to open later this year. The city of L.A. honors the lives of those lost in a mass genocide in the Ottoman Empire. Rasha Goel has more on what is being done to support the Armenian community here in Los Angeles. The intersection at Hollywood Boulevard and Western Avenue will now be known as the Armenian Genocide Memorial Square. Council members Mitch O'Farrell and Paul Krikorian spearheaded the motion which prompts the LA Department of Transportation to erect a sign at the square. This square will be a permanent reminder of the plight and just cause of the Armenian people and will appropriately recognize the tragedy that befell the grandparents and great-grandparents of many of our constituents. April 24th of this year marks the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, which was planned and executed by the Turkish government. The massacre killed one and a half million Armenians and forced countless others to leave their ancestral homeland. The Armenian Genocide of 1915 is not only a national tragedy of the Armenian people, it's a tragedy for the mankind as well. 
The unveiling of the sign will happen here in Little Armenia on the morning of April 24th. It will then be followed by a six mile march, which starts here and ends at the Turkish consulate. March for Justice, which will be an unprecedented event. Uh, we will have tens of thousands of people on the streets of Los Angeles. I want to highlight the importance of using this as an opportunity to educate our youth and our neighbors about the first genocide of modern times. Los Angeles' Little Armenia is located in Councilman O'Farrell's 13th district and, according to officials, is the only designated Armenian neighborhood in the nation. In Hollywood, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. City Hall will also be lit in purple on April 24th and 100 pomegranate trees planted to recognize the centennial of the Armenian genocide. Construction of a new terminal connector at LAX is moving full speed ahead as the structure begins to take shape. Yana Kay has more from LAX. Construction crews place the final steel beam on the frame of the new Terminal 4 connector, marking a major milestone for LAX. The Terminal 4 connector is a giant step forward in our goal of securely connecting all LAX terminals and as part of the overall plan to transform LAX into modern and efficient airport. Airport officials signed the beam before it was hoisted to its final position on the steel structure. When completed, the connector will make it easier for international and domestic passengers to get to and from the South Terminals and the Tom Bradley International Terminal. Officials say this will be the first time there will be a secure connection from a domestic to an international terminal. So an arriving international passenger coming in, for example, on American Airlines will be able to get off their flight and just walk right through that upper level corridor, which will take them right into the, the new Bradley West core. They won't have to go through security. They won't have to recheck their bags. Turner construction crews began work on the project nearly two years ago and have collaborated with airport officials to achieve a common vision for the airport. The T4 connector is really an example of Los Angeles's forward momentum in the design, the economy, and the sustainability. And for over 50 years of constructing in LA, Turner Construction exemplifies these values. The Terminal 4 connector will also have a bus service that will transfer passengers between Terminals 5 and 8. Construction is expected to be completed in 2016. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. The connector will also feature an outdoor public plaza. An old blighted piece of land in the valley has been transformed into a space the whole community can use. Anna Marcos takes us to the grand opening of Panorama City's newest park. The Mid Valley Multipurpose Intergenerational Center has just opened, and already it has become a favorite stomping ground for some park users. The site becomes the 30th park built under the city's 50 Parks Initiative. You come out here with your family, maybe have a birthday party. There's a, there is some fitness uh, equipment in the back and some uh, play, uh, play area in the back. So it's going to be you know, more of a, uh, uh, you know, just come out here and enjoy the, enjoy the weather, enjoy the park. You come into this building and you've got high ceilings, you've got sliding doors that open on both sides of it so that when you have an event it can spill to the outside. It's a really nice facility. and. Um, Looks like they're going to have a lot of little programs that, according to the sign, anyways. The center will be holding Zumba, exercise, and line dancing classes, as well as arts and crafts. There will be activities for all ages, from children to seniors. Well, what do you think you'll do here? Dance Just play and gymnastics. dance. Gymnastics. Play and dance, huh? And do ballerina stuff. Ballerina stuff. <laughs> City leaders estimate about 11,000 residents, 3,400 of them kids, will be using this park, which is located in an apartment dense area. We're trying to bring the parks to the community. The park will be earth friendly with an electric car charging station and a bioswale that filters, cleans, and recharges rainwater and puts it back into the groundwater table. Best of all, the park is people friendly for both little kids and for the big kids. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The city attorney files lawsuits against two more nuisance properties. The city gives away free rain barrels. Find out how you can get one. Also an exhibit celebrating women. These stories in City Beat. 
L.A. City Attorney Mike Feuer has announced a crackdown on several crime-ridden properties recently via lawsuits, the latest ones in the communities of Venice and Del Rey. These are part of a coordinated citywide effort to rid Los Angeles neighborhoods of these nuisances. In the case of one of these properties, there have been 16 drug-related arrests in the past year. In the case of the other property, there have been six drug-related arrests just in the past several months. We have in our office the ability to bring litigation to stop this activity. The city attorney says the Venice property is not far from a school and child care center, while the Del Rey property is just a few houses away from a park. Free rain barrels are being offered again by the city after Keep Los Angeles Beautiful, a program within the city's Board of Public Works, has secured another 1,000 55-gallon syrup barrels and rain barrel conversion kits from Coca-Cola after its first rain barrel giveaway last fall was sold out immediately. L.A. residents can go to bpw.lacity.org to sign up. As soon as we release these dates, people sign up because it is required that everyone pr uh, participate in an education program, which is only about 15 minutes. But it's important that we make sure that everybody installs these units correctly at their home. We just got the turf removal done on our front lawn. So it's all pretty rock and wet water-wise plants. Now we got the rain barrels and we're going to see what else we can do to help save water. The Department of Water and Power is also offering a $100 per barrel rebate up to four barrels if you purchase them on your own. At the recent barrel giveaway event, the city also gave away free trees to help with the city's canopy cover. The city's El Pueblo Historical Monument celebrated National Women's History Month with an exhibit at the Pico House Gallery called From Her, an exhibition by women about women. This year's exhibit sought to explore how women see themselves in relation to nature, if they do at all. The entries ranged from pencil sketches to watercolor to even textured, three-dimensioned artwork. This was the second year the city hosted an exhibit honoring Women's History Month. After last year's inaugural exhibit was deemed a huge success, El Pueblo put the call out for submissions again this year. It's been a landmark in the Hollywood community for the last century, known for its Asian-inspired cuisine and its breathtaking view. As Yana Kay reports, it's now receiving official recognition from the city. We hereby salute Mount Yamashiro! City Council Member Tom LaBonge unveiled a new sign that reads Mount Yamashiro in honor of the historical Yamashiro restaurant that sits high above Hollywood Boulevard. When you read signs, you get in, in touch with community. When you read plaques, you get in touch with hi history. And Yamashiro is certainly filled with history. For the last century, the restaurant, which was designated as a historical building, has served as a popular destination for locals and tourists, thanks to its stunning vistas and panoramic views all the way to the ocean. But the sign represents an even larger meaning. It is very great honor to the Japan and the Japanese people because it embodies the real true love of Los Angeles uh, towards Japanese culture. Perched 605 feet above sea level, the sign is set against a stunning backdrop that includes Mount Baldy. Yamashiro's owners say they've worked hard to maintain the beauty of the building and its surroundings. Trying to make it as uh, authentic as we could um, and uh, keep its character, keep its uh, structure, keep its architectural uh, integrity. Now you can't miss the sign. It's conveniently located right in front of the entrance of the restaurant so folks will be able to enjoy the view and see the sign right up close and personal. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. Yamashiro has also been featured in countless television shows and films. In this week's list of things to do, a one-woman show in Silver Lake, an Easter egg hunt in the valley, and a zebra made out of jelly beans at the zoo. Celebrate Women's History Month by attending a free performance depicting the mother of modern dance, Isadora Duncan. The one-woman show features actress Cress Mursky, who's described by The Hollywood Reporter as a talent of major proportions. She will interpret the legendary free thinker at Silver Lake Branch Library during its free program on Thursday, March 26th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. The library is located at 2411 Glendale Boulevard. Call 323-913-7451 for more information.
On Saturday, March 28th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Shadow Ranch Park at 22633 Van Owen Street in West Hills will be the site of the 8th Annual Extravaganza and Health and Safety Fair. This is the eighth year the event is being presented by the Shadow Ranch and the Woodland Hills Recreation Centers, along with the West Hills Neighborhood Council. You can get your picture taken with the Easter Bunny, play games, search for Easter eggs, of course, and learn about community resources for disaster preparedness. This event is also in need of volunteers to help with setup and teardown, as well as assistance with the egg hunt. Go to westvalleyevents.org. Artist Kristen Cummings will create a large-scale artwork of the Los Angeles Zoo Zebra entirely out of Jelly Belly Jelly Beans. You can see the creation on Saturday and Sunday, March 28th and 29th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the LA Zoo. Once complete, the 4 by 5 foot jelly bean mosaic becomes part of the Jelly Belly Endangered Species Bean Art Traveling Collection, which tours the country for display at museums and through animal conservation programs. You can see some of the jelly bean animal art at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash LATheSweet. While at the zoo, visitors can also check out the adorable newborns now at the zoo, including baby chimps, otters, a hippo, and a giraffe. The LA Zoo is located at 5333 Zoo Drive. Go to lazoo.org for details. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. And staying on the topic of the zoo, there are some new arrivals at the LA Zoo this spring, and some of them come from the land down under. Anna Marcos takes us there. Springtime at the LA Zoo has a decidedly Aussie feel to it this year. The marsupial exhibits koala baby joeys and kangaroo joeys, two of each, were born last year and are about to spring out of the pouch. They poke body parts out, so uh, you'll see a leg, you might see an arm, um, you might see the head coming out. The baby kangaroo joeys, about nine months, still spend a lot of time inside their mother's pouches. But sometimes they come out to try out the sweet potatoes and corn or to stretch out their legs. Finally, after much peekabooing, a kangaroo joey steps out in a big way. It was pretty cool. We didn't know they were here, so it was a nice surprise to see the little babies. She liked watching it jump around. And while the baby kangaroos are still getting their lamb legs, the koala joeys are now permanently out of the pouch. Though you still don't see them much, they spend most of their time burrowed against their mother's stomach. You can barely see this little one's claws peeking out. Koalas, it seems, have plenty of unusual traits. The koalas um, only eat eucalyptus. Uh, it is a very toxic plant for a lot of different species of animals, uh, but they do have um, a special bacteria in their gut that actually allows them to break down uh, the toxins. And in the Australia Nocturnal House, which just opened, there is yet another marsupial surprise. This is the public's first look at the southern hairy-nosed wombat. There are only eight of them in North America. Meanwhile, the baby joeys are learning to do what all marsupials learn. For the koalas, it involves a lot of sleeping and eating. For the kangaroo joeys, well, Jumping around on feet this big takes some getting used to. I'm Anna Margos for LA This Week. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. Our Twitter handle is at LATW35. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.